But look at the digraph plot. Remember, if it was all uppercase and all lowercase, you should just have the lower right block being, you know, the common digraphs. But we're seeing digraphs of many pairs within the printable ASCII range. Bing, good. This is base 64 encoding. Okay. So the first part is you see what what does this indicate? The the digraph view indicates what? Yeah, it, it, it now we're Actual. we're doing something here though. And actually let me let me slot do this. Okay? As I slide through the file it's shifting. So think back to the addons, adding and subtracting a constant as a simple encoding technique. So here we've added zero. If you go uh, through the file, like say in this bottom right corner, we've added 255 to every value. So what it's done is shifted it all the way to the right. So again, this shows you that just simply adding or subtracting a value, it's kind of like a known plain text attack, right? You know it's uh, ASCII text going in. If you try and obscure it with um, just a, uh, a simple adding or subtracting a constant, remember shift cipher, it, uh, it just shifts, literally shifts the digraph. So and you here is a looking glass that sees through that obfuscation. Yeah. And then as you slide, you can notice as you go through the file, it gets brighter and brighter because it's getting higher and higher order bits until it wraps around. And then back down. Okay. So what we've done here is you see this rainbow effect? We've applied an, um, a key to each of those, an 8-bit key. Um, 8 bit XOR. So we've, we've chosen a random 8 bit key and applied it to, uh, I think it's 20 lines at a time. So you can see this rainbow effect where it's chosen to XOR a different range. But as you play this, you can see that, that the structure still is there. You've, you've done 8 bit XOR and it still, regardless of the key, where this is like exhaustively going through the entire key space and you can see that each of the potential keys still has a distinct st structure shining through. And part of it is th this, there's that one region, that, that darker block that, you know, here it's in the top left, that you, that you can think about that given the key that was chosen, the input was very high in a certain range, 32 to 127, but actually probably lowercase letters, th that range is what shines through. And then even if you do 16-bit XOR, so it's just two alphabets, right? So when the al when the keys, uh, you, you can see the two alphabets here popping through in, in this uh, attractor. I'm sorry. So you can see the the two. One key had the effect of shifting it here. The other key put it down in the lower left quadrant. And then as you play through, and different keys are chosen, they sh they show up in different places. So this is an indicator of text being XORed with a um, you know, 16 bit key. Yeah, you would get the same effect if you composed two uh, very different languages uh, that have their own uh, natural uh, digraph structure, nat natural bigram structure, uh, but uh, they just simply don't mesh. Either that or you're seeing double. So this one's a little different. When I coded it, I, um, I forgot to do one thing. So I, it, when I wrote this, I intended, okay, this is going to be 32-bit XOR. But as it turns out, um, I only uh, made, it's really 24-bit XOR and the last key, the, the, third, the fourth value was zero. So what you see then are these vertical lines here. All right, you see the, the vertical lines, that's because every fourth uh, byte value is zero. And I confirmed that by looking at it. But anyway, it showed you something was amiss. That even when we play this though, this is essentially 24 bit XOR. You can see the different alphabets still popping through the key, or popping through the obfuscation technique. And it might be hard to see, but if the, the digraph, if you think about one, if one of the keys is zero, um, you, you've got digraphs here then. So, uh, I'm sorry, not if one of the keys is zero. Yeah, you, you get digraphs of, uh, the bytes of the key. yeah, the bytes of the key at the, at the top and at the bottom. Okay. I think that was it for these. Okay, so I think. Let's go on. Yeah. 
So we've shown you visually what this looks like. Now we've done, now each of these lines is a thousand samples as pure as we could make them of that given type. So at the top, um, we have random examples, encrypted examples, compressed examples, um, and the left red box is average byte value. The right va uh, line or right box is uh, the uh, entropy, Shannon entropy. So what we have is, um, so you see high entropy, you know, this cluster. And then, but you notice that there's statistically difference, uh, difference between the encoded version, still the high entropy. We encoded zip files, uh, but the average byte values are significantly different. Machine code, against significantly different. Bitmaps, but with bitmaps, recall that they could be anything. So they're very diverse in our samples. And the, the standard deviation there is 69, which is huge, which means it's all over the place. And then text, um, again, a pretty consistent view. So we plotted those, uh, one uh, entropy versus byte value. And the idea is there's intuition here that we can programmatically detect some of these things. Uh, you've got a, now the high entropy cluster, it's really hard. That's a non trivial problem to, to pull that apart. But as a unit, the idea of you know, high entropy, uh, that can be detected pretty straightforward. Uh, pulling out the base 64 encoding and, and UU encoding, pretty straightforward from our experiments. Of course there's going to be noise and there's going to be things, you, unanticipated things. Machine code stands out, ASCII text uh, and bitmaps. And it would be interesting in the, in the future to draw these boxes based on the standard deviations, you know, to kind of get a feel for how big each region is. It's a little bit bigger or, or smaller than the, the marker that we've used. So, and these are only two, uh, these are only two um, possible statistics that you can throw at the thing. Mm. They are really, uh, yeah, and they are really well known, well understood and simple. Now imagine what you can do if you take uh, uh, an aggregate of uh, 10 or more statistics. What kind of clusters would emerge? Some of those actually do catch the artifacts of compression uh, and um, of particular kinds of encryption, especially if the key is not chosen wisely and if proper padding is not applied. So you might actually be able to visually detect uh, decrypt, uh, encryption with a key uh, that wasn't chosen properly or uh, with a key with, or where the right padding scheme, scheme uh, was not used. Uh, now let's do something else. <laughs> let's try to see visually how some things are like the others and others are not. Uh, the inspiration here is this wonderful, wonderful uh, work done by two physicists who managed to reproduce almost entirely the phylogenetic tree of languages by taking the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in every language in which it, in which it was written and compressing those uh, files uh, together and separately and noticing how much better they actually compress together. The idea being that while you're compressing one file, you are uh, already working up a string table, and that string, string table helps you compress the other file better. And so this is what we did to binary fragments. And you get those uh, bathroom tile kind of uh, pictures where you have many fragments of different types. You group them, and then you see how well or what the compressed file would look like. So in this byte plot, I'm taking uh, a, a Linux x86 executable uh, and compressing it with the uh, rest of the uh, x86 Linux executables, so it's home team, so to say. And uh, instead of collapsing the strings that are in my string table for compression, which is how the Lempel zip compression works. Instead of collapsing them, I color them in their entirety with the color that um, uh, the, 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 darker, uh, the darker it is, uh, the more frequent that um, uh, string, the, the more frequently that string is known to appear in that uh, corpus. And so you see that uh, there are pretty long runs of uh, of, of uh, strings that were found. So uh, those are verbatim uh, repeated in other files like that. Whereas if I, if I compress it with uh, my bunch of bitmaps, uh, it doesn't look so good. 
In fact, uh, I, get, uh, I don't get long blocks at all. Uh, I get short blocks and some of those are just bytes, which means uh, I ran out of uh, my uh, string table and uh, I am not seeing uh, the same strings that I was seeing when I was generating the string table. Uh, now, some of those things are more like the others. This is the executable code uh, compressed with music. And you see certain periodic structure. These things actually uh, occur in code as well. Uh, but they're not long and their distribution is strange. So uh, these are the, the, those triples that you know, could be executable code. So uh, I'm going to show that um, with luck, I'm going to show that live. Do, I have the, do we have the time? A couple of minutes. Let's see if this works. Uh, if, uh, if this doesn't, uh, then uh, we'll give you the demo. Okay. All right, great. Great. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, this is a very visual cat. It's ogling the, the binaries. Sorry. All right. So uh, here is a uh, particular uh, bit of binary code compressed with its uh, native. A data set. Here is the bitmap that we've seen. How does it look when I compress it with bzipped text? Well, again, not so good. Uh, what happens if I compress it with uh, encrypted text uh, samples? Again, uh, you don't see any long blocks here. And so you can uh, go through uh, the different kinds and see where you're getting uh, longer runs that are common to that data set. Let's look at uh, the windows. So it's not quite the home team, but not quite the antagonist. And you actually see a little bit of similarity here. Uh, some of those, uh, you know, the, some of those uh, byte runs generated by the compiler are like the others, and some are not. And so you can, uh, this is a little processing application. Uh, uh, this is the music example, and um, so it goes. Compressing things together with uh, random files does not help much because you don't get to see much of the similarity. So uh, that way, you can very quickly spot um, sharing of substrings, byte substrings, uh, between uh, two files. So, and this is uh, nothing but a uh, very simple limpulsive uh, compression with counting of uh, the uh, occurrences, the frequency of the occurrences of the uh, strings on the table. And uh, let's go back to A. Okay, good. So we, uh, just to kind of recap, we, you know, we showed you the insight that we saw Visually, the statistical outliers, and then the the fact that there are just statistical differences, and you can use statistical signatures. You can use what Sergey uh, basically is a compression-based classifier and other techniques. Um, so, thinking about this. Uh, it, as we move forward, obviously there's the bitmap diversity and data, stru data structure diversity problem that they could be anything, but we believe in practice they typically aren't very. There's enough similarity there that they could be identified. Uh, the, that cluster of high entropy types, it's, it's hard to separate those, particularly in small sizes. Um, I think we've gotten a reason, you know, following things as they're transformed, um, sometimes the transfer transformation is so severe nothing really shows through, other times it does, like in our examples. Uh, and also like to, uh, actually you were going to comment on the uh, Yes, yes. So uh, it is a the technique, it is well known that you can disguise things. So uh, my favorite uh, disguising tool, uh, early disguising tool is John Erickson's Dissembler, uh, which takes uh, shell code and translates it into ASCII-only shell code so that 